thing you'll ever need. Everything you'll ever need. I've got the answer for that this morning. Everything you'll ever need. And I'm going to start off with a, a little bit of what God showed me as part of my journey on our sabbatical. And um, it kind of shook me up a little bit. It kind of took me by surprise, but it made sense. Again, God always seems to make sense, doesn't he? <laughs> but there was a song that was on the radio quite a bit back in uh, summer and, and in the fall. And it, it was called, the name of it was, I Got Saved by Selah. I don't know whether some of you remember that. And, and it was just a song about salvation and getting saved and so you know again there was to me again it was like there wasn't any new revelation in there but it just got my attention and um and i couldn't really understand why but i kept listening to it and one day as we were as i was at home and doing my devotions and and, and i just went downstairs and i printed the chord sheet off and i'd had it on the on the keyboard downstairs and i went down there and i just played it and sang it and played it and sang it and played it and sang it, I don't know, three or four times, and then God showed me. The last line of the chorus is, I've got Jesus, how could I want more? I got Jesus, how could I want more? I thought, oh. you know, and so I had to mull that over in my mind, and then, then I was also at the same time reading a, a book on on, uh, on the book of Revelations. It's called Discipleship on the Edge by Daryl uh, Johnson. Pastor Chuck mentioned it yesterday, but he just goes through the book of Revelations and just uh, opens up a whole new world, uh, or it did for me. And, and I was reading, uh, he was going through uh, the letters to the churches in Revelations 2, the letter to the church in Ephesus. In, in verse 1, it says, to the angel of the church of Ephesus, right? And then he goes on and tells them what they've done good. But then it goes to verse 4, and he says, but I have something against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your candlestick from its place, unless you repent. And then he goes on, and he has a little conversation in the book. He says, but Lord, I'm working hard for the church. I know that you've lost your first love. But Lord, I'm fighting for the truth on all kinds of fronts. I know, but you have lost your first love. But Lord, I came out on the front lines securing beachheads for the kingdom. I know, thank you, but you have lost the attentiveness, the tenderness, the extravagance of your first love. Whoa. You know, that just kind of hit me on the side of the head, and I thought, what's going on here? And then as I continue to read, he says, you know, it's not something that happens overnight. You know, it doesn't happen instantly, but it's just a gradual, a gradual change, a gradual shift of focus that you don't even realize until something sort of slaps you upside the head, right? There was another quote I want to take from that book. It says, where simple love for Jesus goes, so does the light. Without first love, Service becomes lifeless, routine, or even drudgery. Without first love, endurance becomes the joyless shuffle of the stone. Now, I tried to find where that quote came from, but I couldn't. But I think it sort of makes its point, doesn't it? Without first love, orthodoxy, what I believe, what I stand for, becomes narrow-minded, nitpicking legalism. And without first love, hatred of the practices of the Nicolaitans becomes hatred of the Nicolaitans themselves. <laughs> this guy knows how to hit the nail on the head, I guess. You know, he just, it just, again, there's stuff in here that just slapped me. And I thought, whoa, I better be careful here, you know? So then he says, well, this is what you need to do if that's your problem. And you've lost your first love, you need to do this. Number one, in from verse 4, it says, remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, and otherwise recognize the situation you're in. So that's what I did. I recognized it. I admitted it to myself and to God, and I confessed my lack of, my loss of, however you say that, of first love. I can't. Anyways, I recognize the situation, and then <laughs> repent, he says, to repent. And you know repent, we know what it means. But it's harder to do. Stop and make a radical U-turn. You're repenting, you're stopping what you're doing, and you're going to do something else. 
shift the focus back on to him. He says to change schedules, habits, or commitments in order to restore intimacy. Well, I didn't have any schedules at that point. We were on our sabbatical. I didn't have any, a whole lot of commitments. So I was able to take the time and turn back to him and follow him. This, this was a little bit harder, though. He says, you know, to confess that I was in love with other lords. Confess that I was maybe worshiping work. That success and financial security are more important than simply loving Jesus. You know, that's not our goal. We know better than to go there, and yet sometimes we shift and we head, up, head off in that direction without even realizing it. But God knows. He doesn't miss any of that. He knows when we've lost our first love. So I repented. And then he says to go do the works you did at first, to redo, go back and do the things we did at first. And the quote in the book again is, can you hear the divine lover calling? You used to listen for my voice. You used to take time to be still before me and to seek my face and enjoy my company. You used to open yourself up to my word daily. Nothing got in your way. You used to not complicate my commandments. You took them at face value and found freedom in obeying them. You used to weep for those who do not know me. You used to realize you cannot make it on your own and throw yourself on me with reckless abandon. And again, as I read through that, it was like, oh, I need to get back to my first love. God loves us, and he longs for us to love him. One more quote from the book. And Daryl Johnson says, Jesus is calling us to do whatever it takes to restore first love. Nothing satisfies us but him and his love. Nothing satisfies us but him and his love. And nothing satisfies him but us and our love. You know, do we really believe that? And yet, that's what it says in the Word time and time again. If you read the Word and you read it like it's, we've been told it's a love letter, you can read right from the beginning to the end and you can see the love that Jesus has for his creation. He longs for intimate communion with us. He longs to be our first love. So then I just processing this and went back to that song. And the chorus of the song is, I'm undone by the mercy of Jesus. I'm undone by the goodness of the Lord. I'm restored and made right. He's got a hold of my life. I've got Jesus. How could I want more? Everything you'll ever need. Everything you'll ever need. I've got Jesus. How could I want more? So I, I spent weeks, maybe even months, and I'm still processing this and growing in my understanding of what it really means to make Jesus my first love. I kept it in front of me and spent time in the Word and in His presence, and surrender was something that came up often. So it's just, you know, just to raise my hands and say, I surrender to you. I want to love you like you want me, like you want me to. I want you to be my first love. You know, and that understanding that he is everything I'll ever need is becoming stronger and just a, a, it's hard to explain, but a bigger reality. And you know what else I found out? It works with everything else I'm doing in my life. It's not my relationship with Jesus over here, my relationship with my husband and family over here, and my work over here. They're not in competition. They're not separate. In fact, in putting Jesus first, I can be truly successful in all those areas. It all comes together. You know, um, it's in loving him first that I can see the potential to becoming everything he wants me to be. It's in loving him first that I can see the potential to do everything I feel in me he wants me to do. That's why I wish I knew how to dance. 
but I grew up in a, where that was almost the unpardonable sin. So, so I, you know, I don't have that freedom yet, and I feel like if I did, it would be scary. So, <laughs> but anyways, you know, to just it's been a real awakening, and it's been it's brought life to my spirit to be able to return to my first love. So we've been talking about how much he loves us. How much do we love him? He's everything we'll ever need. So I want to look at a few things, uh, hopefully four things this morning, that, um, that just prove that Jesus is all you'll ever need. Did you know that, he, number one, he is the source of life, the source of your life, and we get that, that he created and stuff. But there's more to it than that. Look at John 1, 1 to 5. In the beginning, the Word already existed, the Word being Jesus. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was already with God in the beginning. Everything came into existence through Him. Not one thing that exists was made without Him. He was the source of life, and that life was the light for humanity. And that light shines in the dark, and the dark has never extinguished it. Do we believe that? Or do we look at the world around us and think that maybe the dark is certain to take over? It's not. He is the light. And he is the source of life. Yes, he created us. But it's more than that. You know, there's a deeper, uh, and again, it's hard to explain, spiritual, you know, ultimately it's a supernatural force of life alive in us because we believe in Jesus. You know, sometimes you hear people say, whoa, I've never felt so alive. But usually they just got off a roller coaster or, you know, <laughs> been on some thrill ride. That's just an adrenaline rush. And while that's fun and good, that's going to pass. Unless you stay on that ride. But, <laughs> you know, it's more than just even being in your happy place and finding that perfect someone. You know, there is life in that. But the life that Jesus brings is a fullness of life that is, that is hard to explain. you got to feel it because it's an inner thing. It's inside of you. It's not about what's going on around us. There is fullness of life no matter what's going on around us. Ephesians 3, the Apostle Paul is talking, praying for the Ephesian church that according to the riches of his glory, he would grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth, length, and height, and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. There is more out there than what we can see and feel and touch. There's more out there than jumping off a cliff with an elastic band on your foot. There is way more to life than that. The fullness of, a, of abundant life, it's what we all want. It's what we all long for. And in Christ, we have it. We need to grow in our understanding of it. You know, sometimes it doesn't seem like we are experiencing it. Like uh, we prayed for those who were discouraged this morning. Sometimes fullness of life seems a little distant. But, you know, look at, look at Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 4, 8. He says, in every way we're troubled, but we aren't crushed by our troubles. We're frustrated, but we don't give up. We're persecuted, but we're not abandoned. We're captured, but we're not killed. In verse 11, while we are alive, we are constantly handed over to death for Jesus' sake so that the life of Jesus is also shown in our mortal nature. Does that sound like an abundant life to you? You know, when we think of abundance, we think of things. But it sounds like a full life, <laughs> a full, exciting life, right? But it's a life where there's victory in Jesus. There is fullness of life. So we need to be careful that we don't shift our focus onto what we can see and, and touch and what we want. But we need to keep our focus on our relationship with God, on our first love. You know, we like to quote the scripture in, in Psalms 37 that says, He will give you the desires of your heart. 
And he will. But it says, delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. It says, seek first the, the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. We got to keep the horse in front of the cart, right? Don't get things turned around. Our God is longing for us to live that fullness of life that we only have in him. And when we delight ourselves in him and make him our first love, he's everything we'll ever need. Everything we'll ever need. I read this week that the word of God is more important to us than the air we breathe. And you think, well, if I didn't have air, I'd be gone. Yeah. But if you have the word of God and you didn't have air, you'd still have life. Everything you'll ever need, it's found in him. We can trust him in all things. So that's number one, source of life. Number two, he's the source of freedom. He's a source of freedom. As we celebrated communion this morning, you know, it's because of Jesus that we can walk in freedom, that we can walk in victory today. John 12, 31 says, this world is being judged now. Jesus is preparing his disciples for what's to come. This world is being judged now. The ruler of this world will be thrown out now. When I have been lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people toward me. Through Jesus' death and resurrection, the power of sin and death has been broken. That's the reality. That's the reality. Do we still get in trouble sometimes? Yes. But when we repent and turn the other way, there's forgiveness and freedom again. And not only was the power of death and sin broken so that we can walk in freedom, but Satan's power as a deceiver and as a destroyer was also broken. That's what he's all about. Deceiving, he's the father of lies, it says, and he wants to destroy us. But Jesus brings us life, abundant life. So we need to not underestimate the freedom we have because of the victory that, we, that Jesus brought through his death. Don't underestimate that. Walk in the reality of that. Declare the truth of that. Live in that reality. That's where it's at. You know, we all want to be free from our past and from the hurts and the things. And it's there. It's there. Everything you'll ever need found in your first love. Number three, he's the source of power. I like this one. Everybody wants power. 2 Timothy 1.7, For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and self-control. You've got the power. <laughs> Everybody wants power. Power to run other people's lives. Some people want to run the world. You know, power to dominate somebody or something. Everybody wants to be number one. Best at whatever. But you know what? Jesus is all-powerful. He already is dominating. When you stop and think about it, you know, guys, men want to dominate the world. But doesn't it say somewhere in Psalms that, that God laughs at those who, who try and fight against him? If he is in control. He is all-powerful. And, and maybe domination kind of has a negative connotation to it. But that's the reality. God is in control. And it doesn't matter what it looks like around us. God is still in control, and we need to believe that. Jesus' power wasn't based in that same domination that the world has. Jesus' power was based in love, in that love that we've been talking about. He, his love was so powerful it changed the world around him at that time. And do you know what? It is still the only power that actually really changes the world around us. The power of love. We need to understand that too and not get our, let our focus shift 
onto the power of other things. We need to understand the power of love. I, I want to show you, I'm going to read a couple of uh, things, of, uh, paragraphs from Christianity Today. The power of love is strong when we walk in forgiveness. It shows itself strong in forgiveness and, our, and in our ability to stand true to the faith. Do you remember um, in February of 2015, ISIS uh, beheaded 21 most of them were Coptic Christians from Libya. And there's an article in, in this magazine, uh, and Bishop Thomas, who has a church close by there in, in Egypt, and he says, the Libyan martyrs were a turning point, he said, as Coptics watched the victims call out to Jesus in their moment of death. In his church, many have since repented of sin and changed the focus of their life, making faith a priority. Martyrdom is linked to the Christian life, to carry your cross and follow him, said Bishop Thomas. Since we are united to Christ, in this life we are his image. As he forgave, so must we. The martyrs have set an example, he said, but have also left a great responsibility to the church. Christians must fight fear, keep their joy, and strive for justice. You know, powerful. But we don't like to think that God can get glory in something as horrible as that. That's hard for our minds to, to uh, uh, compute. But you know, God has a plan. And those guys were Christians and they're in glory. And if, and if there's a bunch of other people that are saved because of it, I mean, did, did their families grieve? And was there pain and sorrow? Absolutely. But there's that power of knowing Christ as your first love that gives you the ability to overcome. And to see, like Tuck has been talking the past few weeks, things are not as they seem. To see past what our physical eyes can see. One more, one more article, or paragraph from that article, and it talks about a situation where a TV talk show uh, host, uh, uh, quite a, I guess he was one of the big name talk show hosts in Egypt, and, and uh, he was listening to the, the, an interview, or he had watched an interview with a woman whose husband had redirected a suicide bomber at their church, and um, the terrorists detonated the suicide bomb, and this man, her husband, was probably the first one to die in the blast, but because of his actions, he saved the lives of, of many people inside the church. And, and the, his wife, with her children at her side, was being interviewed, and she said, I'm not angry at the one who did this. I'm telling him, may God forgive you, and we also forgive you. Believe me, we forgive you. You put my husband in a place I couldn't have dreamed of. What, what a way to respond. What a way to respond to that. And then the, after the camera went back to the talk show host, it took him 12 seconds. Okay, we're on TV. 12 seconds of just his face and he's not saying anything. That's an eternity. It took him 12 seconds to come up with a response and he finally said, the Coptics of Egypt are made of steel how great is this forgiveness you have his voice cracked you know when we respond with forgiveness the world doesn't know how to respond it throws them right off when we throw a fit and you know do the revenge thing they're happy with that that makes a good story but when they when we respond with forgiveness they don't know how to respond. And in this article, it says that there's many, that the Coptics have been experiencing much persecution in those areas over the years. And the forgiveness is a major part of their, their belief system. And so they've been walking in forgiveness. And it says that the Muslims around them, they don't know what to think. Because that's not how they would respond, right? So God is moving. And the power of love through forgiveness is huge. Jesus was everything these people needed. 
Matthew 10, 28 says, Don't be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Instead, fear the one who can destroy both body and soul in hell. These guys got that. They're, they were so connected. The first love was so strong that they, it wasn't about what happens to me physically. I love God and I want to see his kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. The last point, num number four, is our, he is our source of hope. He is our source of hope. We've talked that he is our source of life. He is the, our source of freedom and victory. He is our source of power. He is also the source of hope, and we all need hope. And we have hope for today. In what we've already talked about, we have hope for today. We can walk in victory today. But you know what? That's not all. There is an incredible and certain hope for the future when we understand our first love. We need to keep our focus on the hope that we have through Jesus for the future because that hope will give us strength to stand today. Remember years ago, I think it was kind of when the, first, when the charismatic movement first started taking off, there was the, a saying, you know, these people are so heavenly minded, they're no earthly good. I'm not sure that's a... That might have been a compliment. <laughs> but you know what? I think we've gone too far the other way. And this is far more dangerous that we're so earthly minded, we're no heavenly good. And we don't want to go there. We don't want to stay there. We need to keep our focus on, on, on God. We need to be heavenly minded. We need to keep our first love real and true. Heaven is our hope. Eternal life in the tangible presence of God Almighty. <laughs> what more could you ask for? And it's there for you. Even Daniel, at the end of, um, of the book of Daniel, after he's been, a heavenly messenger has been showing him many different visions and different things, and they've been terrible about what was to come. The last verse in the book of Daniel, the heavenly messenger says to Daniel, but go on until the end. You will rest. And you will rise for your inheritance at the end of time. You will rest, but go on. And even those letters to the churches where it says, to him who overcomes, there is a promise of better things with Christ. When we keep him as our first love, when we focus on him as our first love, you've got everything you need. We've got everything we need, and we become everything we're supposed to be. The glory of the Lord is seen around us and people are drawn to the light. So it's not just about us becoming who he wants us to be for our sake. It's letting that light shine because God's heart is for souls and our hearts need to be for souls. Everybody around us. So when we have that intimate relationship with him, the light the glory of God shines from us. Matthew 5 says, In the same way, let your light shine in front of people. They will see the good that you do and praise your Father in heaven. That's where it's at. We've got everything we need to take the gospel everywhere it needs to go. To be what he's called us to be. And that's who we are as a church. A church that loves God and that loves others and serves. That keeps our first love right that's the first thing and the rest will all fall into place let's pray father you are an awesome god and we love you and we worship you today thank you that you've called us into uh, intimacy and oneness and into first love with you thank you lord that you love us so much that's what you long for us to walk in that love to know how much you love us and then to love you Lord, I just pray for each one in this church today. Father, I just pray, God, that you would just um, open our hearts to the overwhelming power of your love for us. God, that you would, that we would just uh, submit to your drawing us into your presence. We would surrender all the lies and the, that we believed all the we walk in forgiveness of the things that we've done or whatever, the walls that we've built up that keep us from intimacy with you. God, I just thank you. 
that you love your people. You forgive us when we failed you. You restore us. God, you are everything we'll ever need. Open our hearts to that today so that we can walk in the fullness of life, in the freedom, in the victory, the power, and the hope that you have for us. God, we love you and we worship you today. While heads are bowed and eyes are closed, I just, is there some, is this just ringing with your heart, you know, that you need to return to your first love? Or maybe you need to surrender for the first time to Jesus. And if that's you, I ask you just to raise your hand and, and I just want to pray for you today. Ah, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Are there any other hands? Just want to just want to connect with God in a real in a fresh way. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Father, you see these hands and these hearts that were raised before you. And I thank you, God. You hear the cry of our hearts. Father, we just lift them up to you right now. God, we all join together in, in lifting up those who have raised their hands to you this morning. That you would just speak life to their hearts. You would renew and refresh. In Jesus' name, you would... Um, those walls would come down, Lord. That the truth would be seen in Jesus' name. And that you would just be their life. Be their freedom. Be their power and their hope.